I also, uh, one thing I really liked about Steve is that he's very human. <laughs> And in fact, when I was emailing him about traveling over, he told me that he was quite sore because he just got done playing a cricket match and that he was a top scorer despite being the oldest man on the pitch. And he also managed to get a wicket bowling. So he's a, he's a true all-rounder in that sense. Um, Steve has published well over uh, 240 papers on the various topics that he's been exploring. And he's mentored over 60 PhD students. Steve's really interested in the links between biodiversity and ecosystem function in the context of climate change and other factors such as overfishing and coastal development. Uh, and I should just warn you that Steve's asked me to let him know when 30 minutes are up, so don't mind me blurting out. Steve's talk is Marine Biodiversity and Ecosystems in a Rapidly Changing World. Please welcome Steve. now faced with it's okay Okay, you can tell I'm pretty crap with computers. Um, I suppose it's my age. Um, a, a couple of quite ironic things uh, happened to me on the, on the way here on Tuesday morning. I was at the meeting of the university executive group with the provost and all the other deans, and we were discussing the university's carbon management plan and our wider sustainability agenda, and our need to cut our carbon footprint by 20% in the next five years, as, um, as dictated to us by our funding agency. And we were, we were struggling because we were also trying to grow 20% in that time. And um, I had to rather sheepishly say, I've got to leave halfway through the meeting. I've got to get a taxi up to Heathrow to fly over to Boston to give a talk on sustainable coastal cities. Um, and it was, I was pretty stupid because really I should have been on public transport, but I would have missed the meeting if I'd been on public transport, particularly given the state of the rail network in the UK at the moment. Um, and then when I arrived here at the other end, uh, I'm, I met a particularly fierce lady going through immigrations. Um, and uh, this lady looked at me and obviously looked a bit dodgy. And she said, you know, what brings you to Boston? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm coming to give a talk at Northeastern. She said, what's it on? I'm talking about uh, climate change. She says, do you believe in that stuff? <laughs> so at this stage, I thought I was about to get chucked out of the country before even coming in. <laughs> Anyway, so what, what, what I'm going to try to talk about today is a fairly broad canvas, and I'm actually going to pick up many of the themes that the previous speaker talked about, and we haven't colluded at all, and that would have, that would have meant some organisation on, on both our parts. But I'm going to certainly reinforce some of the things that the previous speaker has said, and hopefully set the scene for some of the discussion this afternoon. So the last few years, there's been lots and lots of headlines in... Um, even some quite reputable scientific journals like Proceedings of the Royal Society um, about the state of the oceans. And uh, you know, clearly the scientific community is very, very concerned and, uh, about the state of the oceans. At the end of the day, a lot of this is because we've progressed in the last 150 years from basically a local and artisanal use of the coasts and oceans to a much more global and industrialised use. And um, th these are some postcards I found shopping in St Ives over Easter when I was doing some field work. And in the 1890s, the supply chain was quite short. People went to sea in sailing boats, used very primitive methods, and then the stuff got sold by their wives and children on the beach nearby. A very, very short supply chain. Very different than the supply chains that the previous speaker showed, where we've got global fisheries occurring. And uh, 
rather than drawing down lots of nitrogen from the atmosphere or, or mining rocks, rock phosphate and, and, and bringing it halfway around the world, someone would go down with their donkey, get some seaweed and chuck it on the field about you know, maybe half a mile away. So you know, agriculture was, was linked and the things were at a much more smaller scale. Um, this lady here actually crops up later on. She was painted quite often by the, um, by the, the Newland School of Realism in painting, and she, 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 her legs pop up later on in the talk. But very much short supply chains, local markets, and okay, some of these some of these pilchards would have got pickled and sold to sold to Italy, but everything was much much more local. So what I want to do is give a very brief tour of of impacts on global, regional and local scales, some of which have been covered previously. I'm going to talk a little bit about climate change, both stormier and warmer seas. Ocean acidification has already been covered by, by Ove, so I'm not going to talk about that much. I'm going to briefly touch on overfishing. I'm going to dwell on what I call global homogenisation of the seas. I'm going to show some horrific plastic litter pictures which reinforce the previous speaker. And then I'm going to focus on work that I've been involved with by, with many colleagues using 100 year long observations collected by the Plymouth Marine Laboratory, the, the Marine Biological Association of the UK, um, because they help us get a view of disentangling the effects of climate change from other impacts and other impacts that we can do something about. And when looking at these long-term observations, I'm going to try to talk about how to separate out the effects of fishing from climate. I'm going to advocate the use of rocky shore species as very inexpensive sentinels for measuring rates of climate change. I'm going to talk a little bit about adapting to climate change. And in case I run out of time towards the end, my, my message is really that we can't do very much about climate change for the next 50 years other than to make sure that we mitigate, that we cut down emissions. But there's such inertia in the climate system that we're really stuck with what we've got for probably the next 50 years or so, even if everyone had signed up to Kyoto and even if people stopped flying across the Atlantic to give talks. Um, and what we can do is, if we're going to manage climate change and adapt to climate change, we need to manage the interactions of climate change with the things that we can do something about, such as overfishing, such as eutrophication, enrichment of coastal zones, such as inappropriate coastal development. And that really is the take-home message from the talk, so I could probably stop now. But I'm going to go on for a bit. So, climate's not just temperature, it's also about increased frequency of storms, um, more frequent return time of extreme events. Climate influence changes in, in weather systems. In the North Atlantic, both sides of it, we're influenced by something called the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is a winter climate index, which is the difference in pressure between Iceland and the Azores. And in, in negative years, on our side of the Atlantic, we get colder winters. In positive years, we get wet and warm winters with a lot of westerly airstream. And there's some evidence that that's getting influenced. There's also sea level rise. And uh, Ove's talked a lot about reduction of ocean pH, which, if you're a pedant, is probably strictly not climate change, but it's part of messing up the world generally. All these changes will influence biodiversity and ecosystems. There's going to be shifts in environmental gradients. It's going to get warmer at the top of the seashore. Wave action is going to intensify. The oceans are going to be more stratified. There's going to be greater layering of the oceans. And things like salinity will change along estuarine gradients due to changes in rainfall. There's going to be changes in the frequency of disturbance events. Disturbance is really important in many marine systems, but the, the return time of extreme events will change. We know that species are migrating polewards, and this will cause changes in the composition of what you find on a particular part of the ocean floor or on the seashore. And also, in a warming, more extreme world, there's a much great, greater likelihood of non-native invasions. So, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis on fishing down the food web. Sylvia mentioned.